morning, everybody. Morning. <sighs> All right, I'll get serious. So we are still doing our burning question series, and today's burning question, are believers supposed to be accountable to other believers? And if so, what does that look like? How is it accomplished? Uh, real quick, for those of you who weren't here for Daniel's announcements, I did leave sermon notes on the back table there by the communion, so if you'd like to try to keep up with me as I go through scripture, that's where you'll see all the references I'm going to be using today. So, with that said, um, I suppose we ought to start with, what does it mean to be accountable? Well, the dictionary definition of accountable is uh, subject to the obligation to report, explain, or justify something, uh, otherwise responsible or answerable. So, are we obliged to report, explain, or justify ourselves to each other? Let's, let's back that question up a little bit. <coughs> are we obliged to tell other people about salvation? Are we commanded to spread the good news to all corners of the world? Scripture is very clear on this point. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So very simply put, does that not include telling non-believers about sin? I don't think there's any question that we are supposed to be trying to inform the unbelieving world about the very concept of sin so that they can properly identify themselves as being in need of a savior and thus themselves be saved. So with that in mind, are we not accountable to the unbelieving world? I offer three Bible passages for that question. The first is Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And then Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. All right? So accountability starts with, frankly, everyone. But let's narrow it down a little bit. What about our pastor? Is Cody supposed to point out to us when we're sinning? Are we accountable to him for our, our actions? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul writes, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And 2 Timothy in chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in all righteousness. So according to the word, our pastor and our elders, myself included, are required to be ready at all times to shepherd the flock. I am responsible for all of you. What is the tool of a shepherd? It's a crook. It's a stick with a big long hook on the end of it. Which means sometimes, if I'm doing my job and you're doing yours, you're gonna feel that crook around your neck. What's the point? It's not for me to hurt you. It's not for you to feel guilty to me. The elders and the pastor are required to steer you back as a shepherd steers the flock back to the correct path. That crook, is all scripture, which is breathed out by God for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 
So, we're commanded to hold the world accountable for its walk with the Lord. Our elders are commanded to hold the flock accountable for their walks with the Lord. But when should you be prepared to feel that shepherd's crook? What does that accountability to the pastor look like? Well, let's consider some situations where a believer might be trapped in sin. Becoming a Christian does not magically transform us into non-sinning people. We are not better than non-Christians by virtue of following Christ. We're just forgiven. But what do we do when we discover sin in the congregation? What do we do with the brother who is secretly caught looking at pornography? What do we do with the young couple who are living together as man and wife but are not married in the eyes of the Lord? What do we do with a man who does not bridle his tongue and speaks in coarse language at all times? What do we do when our teenagers lie to us about why they were out late? What do we do with the person in the congregation who's self-medicating with alcohol or drugs? There's a great long list of things that a saved person might still find themselves unable to resist. Sins that ensnare the mind by convincing us that in our pleasure lies our happiness. And I have bad news. It comes in the form of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Paul writes, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with, the sexual, with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside the church? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So can anyone argue that it would not be our duty as fellow Christians to point out to another person when they are caught in sin? Scripture makes it pretty clear. But what kind of sins are we talking about here? This is not just a stumble. We're not to expel a person who has a bad day and trips into something like sin. These are lifestyle sins that he's talking about. And he's more specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, not adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now all of this further begs the question, are we required to tell other Christians when we are struggling with or succumbing to a particular sin? And that, I think, is the crux of the question, and whoever asked that question, I think that's the question they actually wanted answered. Do we have to tell each other when we're sinning, when we're caught in a lifestyle <coughs> sin for which we should be expelled if we don't repent? Well, are we supposed to risk embarrassment, condemnation, a lecture, and the very worst of all, being told that we're wrong? That's the worst thing to hear in the world. You're wrong. At least, that's what people think. Would God really want us sharing our deepest, darkest failures with other people? Is it maybe better to just suffer quietly, far from God, unable to ask for forgiveness because of how stuck we are, too embarrassed to ask for help, and too stubborn to see how we are destroying ourselves? What does Scripture have to say? Three verses to consider, and these are the primary verses for today's sermon. James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other, 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should re restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you two. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen... Take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So let's start with James chapter 5, verse 16. I, it can't get clearer. Confess your sins to each other. Why? First... Because as painful as it can be to admit that we were wrong, the weight of sin is so heavy that it affects absolutely everything about us. Getting rid of that weight is literally the act of casting off the crushing chains of iniquity. Because we're then able to pray for each other so that we may be, we may be healed. How? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Our sins have to be confessed pretty much continually so that we can be restored in our relationship with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And in our relationships with each other, we, be, we are restored through this healing prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you yours. We aren't required to confess our sins to each other. We are accountable to each other. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, which reads, If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should re restore that person gently. Imagine for a moment that you have a brother or sister in Christ that you know is committing one of these lifestyle sins. The last thing they need is condemnation. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says a soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. And the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I was hoping one of the kids was going to sing it but nobody saw the prompt so. <laughs> so, so if you are of the spirit, if you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, your response to a sinner should encompass those fruits. You should be approaching them with love and patience and kindness and gentleness. The verse goes on and says, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. That reminds me of Matthew chapter 7 verses 3 through 5. Where Jesus says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In other words, deal gently with other people's sin, because you are also a sinner. It may be you one day who needs to be dealt with gently. And you are not superior in any way over another person with regard to sin. You cannot say, at least I'm not committing that sin. Paul reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short. So, the rest of the verse in Galatians says, carry each other's burdens 
And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. This is a beautiful truth. In bearing each other's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? To love the Lord our God with all of our everything and to love each other as ourselves. Because we love, we share the pain and the suffering of our brothers and sisters. And because we love as he loves, we want to offer the gentle rebuke of correction to bring that person back into relationship with the Lord and with ourselves. <coughs> excuse me. I have three more verses. Excuse me. I can't speak English ever, but apparently not today. Three more verses on this idea. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 2, which says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. This is the condition we find ourselves in when we sin and don't repent. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, this is Jesus talking, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Make no mistake. We all sin. Everybody knows it. When you don't repent of your sin, your relationships with everyone are damaged, even if they're not aware of the sin. Only by repenting, which means turning away with intent to not repeat that sin, do we restore those relationships. <clears throat> now let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, where Jesus says, For if you give, uh, excuse me, for if you forgive others their trespasses. Anybody else remember what? The other thing Jesus said about forgiving others when they sin against you, shout it out if you remember. Nobody ever wants to talk to me in church. Uh, he said, I do not say up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which doesn't mean 490. It means stop counting. It means when your brother or sister repents to you after sinning against you, you forgive them, whether or not it's the 5,000th time. So, let me say it again. Unrepentant sin leads to distance from the Lord, which leaves you at the mercy of the world. It also damages your relationships with each other. But, and that's, that's great, how is accountability accomplished? It's easy to simply say, confess your sins to each other, but how do we do this? Well, I will tell you that my favorite question that Cody asks is, how is your relationship with the Lord? And barring a very few times, he asks me that question every time he sees me. And I've tried to emulate that with all of you. That is a tough, tough question to answer. Because my relationship with the Lord is never everything that I feel that it should be. I know that I am always failing somehow. I haven't been reading my Bible with intention. I haven't been praying when I ought to. I, I've let my mind stray with lustful thoughts. I've allowed myself to be given to gluttony or to sloth. But that's not the point of the question. Cody is not trying to guilt trip me into being a better Christian. He's trying to find ways to encourage me to draw nearer to the Lord so that Christ himself can shine more fully through me. And so accountability begins with encouragement. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 26 through 27. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And finally, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Everybody knows this. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So, I want to challenge all of you to start thinking about everyone in this room as someone who needs your encouragement. We all spend a fair amount of time talking about the parts of our lives that don't have to do necessarily with our walk with the Lord. Maybe we could stand to talk more about what our individual walks with Christ look like. And even more importantly, maybe we could all afford to take an interest in each other's relationship with the Lord. That's where encouragement starts. The next thing we can do is talk about prayer. The best advice I ever heard on prayer, and I don't often follow, uh, when somebody asks for prayer, do it right then. Don't, in other words, like this morning, Matt and Angie pointed out that, uh, that they would like prayer for their housing situation. And we could have said, yep, add it to the list, and probably forgotten about it tomorrow. But instead, somebody, anybody, anywhere, asks you to be in prayer about something, ask them if you can pray about it right then. So that you don't forget so that the Lord appreciates the, the, the earnest urgency of the matter, and so that your brother or sister is encouraged by the fact that you took an interest right now. You can also discuss your prayer life with your brothers and sisters, um, things that you have been praying about, especially about prayers where you are blessed by the Lord, or where the answer to your prayer can be used to encourage someone else. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, uh, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other, and edify one another just as you also are doing. Also Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 25. Therefore brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. A lot of times when I get up here to talk about the morning announcements, you'll hear me talk about how crazy the world is getting. I don't know for sure when the Lord is coming back to get us. I, none of us do. But I, I feel in my bones <laughs> that we're getting close. So as the day approaches, I want part of my job to be to exhort all of you to draw closer to the Lord because he is coming. Maybe not in our lifetimes, Maybe not in our grandchildren's lifetimes, but at some point the Lord is coming and I want us all to be encouraged by that fact. So, but finally, I want to encourage all of you to develop what I'm going to call radical honesty. When you ask each other, how are you, which is the standard greeting, ask it with the intent to hear what's really going on. It's not a throwaway question. Remember that the person you are asking is a beloved brother or sister in Christ, another member of the same body of believers that you belong to. If you are loving them as yourself, 
you will ask because you actually want to hear the honest answer. When you answer that question, I challenge you to answer with the intent to give the whole truth. If you're struggling with something, say that. If you're feeling alone, say that. If you need help or prayer or advice, admit it. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are one body, my beloved brothers and sisters. We serve the Lord, not just individually, but as a family. We owe it to each other to be radically honest. Because if you take everything that I've shown you today, then there is no shame in admitting that you are struggling because you're admitting it to somebody who knows exactly what that means. And if you are loving the person who is admitting that they are struggling, then your desperate desire is to help restore that person. And in doing so, we fulfill the law of Christ. In being radically honest with each other, we shed another chain of sin that might keep us entrapped. And we allow for the gentle rebuke of a loved one to call us to repentance and restoration through Christ Jesus. So, accountability. Are we accountable to each other? Can any of you tell me that we're not? And even if you could, be quiet because you're wrong. Um, <laughs> I think... I, I hope that I've sufficiently demonstrated the idea. We are accountable to each other. Not, it's not judgment. We do not, we are not judges of those in the way that, it's not condemnation is what I mean. It's not a shameful admission. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our Lord became flesh so that he could offer perfect understanding about every temptation we face, as Brenton pointed out in our, uh, in our communion talk. We are, commanded, <clears throat> excuse me, we are commanded to love as he loved, which means with that same understanding and gentleness. We are accountable to the Lord. We are accountable to the unbelieving world. We are accountable to our pastor and our elders. We are accountable to each other as the body of Christ. In holding each other accountable, we encourage each other to draw closer to Jesus. We help each other deal with the trappings of the world and of the enemy that seek to ensnare us. And we do all of this with the love of Jesus first and foremost, in his gentle mercy, by his grace, and holding to his unwavering standard. So, how many of you are up to the challenge? Radical honesty. I see a few nods. I'm going to be radically honest with all of you every morning. When I ask you how you are, I don't want to hear, I'm good, and see you walk by me. You don't have to stop and tell me every little thing that's going on in your lives. But I dare you, I challenge you to give me one thing where God did something awesome in your life since the last time I saw you, or give me one thing that you've been struggling with since the last time I saw you. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to tell you when I'm struggling. Because as husband to a semi-crippled wife, as father to seven insanely energetic monkeys, uh, as, as a servant to all of you in this church, I struggle. And I'm going to lean on all of you to give me the strength to get through it. This body of believers, this, this group of people that the Holy Spirit has indwelt and brought together to worship the Lord. I tell my kids, when, uh, when all you care about is yourself, you've got one person caring about you. But if you care about the rest of the people in the house and let us be the ones to care about you, then there's eight other heartbeats that are going to take care of you. We're going to love you better than you could ever love yourself. In the same way. We are accountable to each other, not to draw condemnation, but 
up to allow ourselves to be loved better than we can love ourselves and to love each other better than each of you could love yourself. So that's my challenge to all of you. And with that, let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for Thank you for giving me the words to, to deliver this message. And thank you for the promises that you have made, Lord, that, uh, that we have a high priest who understands it all and who will accept it all from us and will wash us clean. Thank you for these people, Lord, who have sought to draw closer to you. I pray that you would strengthen each of us through your Holy Spirit and give all of us the ability to be radically honest with each other and to receive that radical honesty from each other with the same gentleness and with the same love and with the same unwavering standard that you demonstrated for us during your, your walk on this earth. As we go from this place, Father, I pray that you would instill in each of us a need to be more intentional about our relationships with you and with each other and, uh, and to, not, to not succumb to worldly shame that leads to destruction, but instead to seek godly repentance so that we can be restored in all ways and in all things. Jesus, all of this is only made possible by you. And so we thank you and we love you and we offer this prayer in your matchless name.